and welcome back now this week we've got a lot to talk about in the terms of this little esp32 and what on earth is it doing here well all right it's passing variables from one to the other how do we do it two ways of doing it and i'll talk to you about both of them we've got a board here i want you to have a look at and last week when we did the prime number test it worked in 64 5 milliseconds now it's running in 1768 milliseconds what is going on more about that towards the end of the video after all this I just wanted to mention my sponsor for this week. It's China's leading electronics components distributor, LCSC Electronics. From their warehouses in Shenzhen, China, and with more Asian brands and lower prices, they can pick and ship our orders in just four hours. And all their components are sourced from authorized distributors or directly from their Asian suppliers at very competitive prices. And if you have many components to buy, you can import your bill of materials BOM file directly into their website. Try it now. Now, if I said to you over here, can you identify this in three seconds? Uh, well, all right, I'll hold it the right way up for you. Yep, it's one of the many Arduino clones. In fact, I used this a little while ago, one of my demos here. That's an Arduino clone. Okay, and that's the standard Arduino shape that everybody's come to know and love. And so what's this one then? This is bit different isn't it yes it's an Arduino shaped board but with an ESP32 on it and as you can see if we can get the light to reflect correctly it's an ESP32 W room 32 and no they still haven't told me what W room stands for and nor W rover hmm their little secret I guess anyway so if you fancy an Arduino shaped board this is um, it and it's not that expensive it says Wemos but I think Lolin are probably making it these days um, i'll put a link down there if you want to follow an affiliate link and uh, it works just as you'd expect it to except now bear in mind this is an esp32 not an arduino so all these pins down here while some of them might be okay like the five volt and the three volt and ground and all that and analog these ones up here are going to be very different aren't they so these the numbering system difficult to get the light on that um but the numbering system on these pins over here is going to be very different. Now the SCL, SDA and all that at the top is okay, but all the right other ones of course are going to be, well, ESP32 specific. So you can't slap a shield on top of this and expect it to work, not unless it's one you've made and designed anyway. Anyway, I'll put a link down below. I thought you might be interested in seeing that they do do it in this format. Um, although I tend to prefer something a little bit smaller for production. This is great for development. But for production, a smaller one like that, or even your own sort of module, is probably um, going to be better, just for the size, really. Right, what else are we going to talk to you about uh, before we get on to passing of the variables? Um, there's a few things from last week's demo, or last video's demo, I'm on the ESP32. Now, we did the demo using Core 0 and Core 1, and they are totally and utterly independent cores. Now... What you have to watch out though is that uh, Artos already uses Core Zero for things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and stuff like that. And Espressive say, caution when you use Core Zero because if you put something on there that is power hungry, CPU cycle hungry, it's going to starve those other tasks of CPUs, and your ESP32 is going to crash. It's as simple as that. What will happen is you'll get a panic message in the serial monitor if you've got it wired up, and it will say panic watchdog leapt into action and then i've restarted it and the trouble is you'll get into a recycled boot at that point so yeah you don't want that to happen so if you're developing stuff i would say keep all your tasks on core one which is what we're going to do for this demo now whilst everything we do in demo land here would work on core zero and or core one I'm still going to push things over to Core 1 a little bit more just to make sure that everybody out there understands that Core 1 is what we should be using. And the good news is, of course, that whether we use Core 0 or Core 1, if your tasks are running on a core, they do not block other tasks. We've got an operating system, right? Our, our TOS is, is there sorting out what's going on under the hood, as it were. And if you've got a task running on Core 1 that says flash an LED delay for a second, flash an LED, and you've got another task running on Core 1 that says similarly, flash an LED, delay for a second. None of those delays interfere with one another. 
That's because the delay no longer is a simple count up loop. It doesn't just count up a loop like it does in an Arduino. The delay tells the operating system, it says, uh, excuse me, operating system, um, I'd like to suspend this task for 500 milliseconds. And the, oper the operating system says, yeah, that's fine, I'll just park you. Right, so you're parked for 500 milliseconds and nothing happens. You do not consume CPU, you do not interfere with other tasks running. And when your time is up, it goes, oh, I'll take you out that suspend queue now and put you into the ready queue to be given some CPU cycles again when your scheduling bit comes around. Okay, that was the first thing. Um, right, the demo today is all about passing variables from one task to another. This demonstrates it, but you won't understand it from that until I've gone through what we're using. And it's all about queues, as the title of the video perhaps has given away. Um, queues are very easy to implement. They're not difficult. And whilst there are alternative to queues, and the, the expressive and the RTOS manuals are saying, you know, you can do this, you can do that maybe, but queues are a really good way of passing variables across um, safe, secure. Let's go and have a look at what queues are all about. So how are these two tasks here going to communicate together? Now if you don't want to know about this sort of theory stuff then you can skip forward to the time shown on the video now and uh, I'll catch up with you when I've gone through the explanation or perhaps you already know this stuff anyway. So you can skip forward if you want otherwise stay tuned keep watching. Task zero, we'll call that a manager task because it's the one that determines the work it wants to do by the little worker task here. And yes, that is a little worker B. Well, I hadn't got a yellow pen, that's why it's blue, all right? So how are these gonna communicate in a safe manner? Well, what they need in the middle is a queue. What's a queue? It's just an area of memory that you've defined and you've said how many elements can fit that queue. To make this a little bit quicker demo, we're gonna have a queue that allows two values. Task zero, the manager, can put values into this queue and task one, the worker, can read values off the queue. So to start with, if these tasks were to start at the same time, task one would be wanting to read something off here but finding nothing, so it waits forever because you've told it that. But task zero, the manager says, ah, there's space, I can put some work on here. Now what this is gonna do for the demo purposes is just to put a number in there and then task one, the little worker bee here, will flash that red LED that number of times. So it's always first in, first out. Uh, you can in fact change where the value goes into the queue, but let's keep this simple. So manager says, I've got some work to do. I want to put a value out there and I'm going to put the value 2 in, the first available slot in my queue. And then it goes away and, and does some other stuff that may take some time. In the meantime, task 1 that's been waiting for stuff to appear here says, ah, yippee, I can read that number off my number two, and as if by magic, that number disappears from the queue. And then task one worker flashes that LED twice and then tries to get another value. Oh, in this instance, there isn't anything. Now, however, the manager gets its act together and says, right, I've got some more work for you, task one. Here's a nine, they are, that should keep you busy for a while. Oh, and even before you've snatched it away, I've got a seven to go behind it. Oh, and I've got, an, oh, I've got another number, but I can't put it in the queue because the queue is now full. So I'm prepared to wait forever until a slot becomes available in that queue so I can put my next number in it. So task one, the busy worker bee, jumps into action and says, great, I'll have the nine, please. And as if by magic, the nine disappears and the seven shuffles up a level. Now, the worker flashes the LED nine times, which takes a little time in her demo. It's about half a second of flash, so it busily goes along. And while it's doing that, whilst it's doing it in parallel, Task zero, the manager says, ah, you've finally given me more space to put another number. Here's a number to go in there, number one. Well, eventually, of course, the worker finishes with the nine and says, give me more work, please. Ah, good, there's a seven. Now, this carries on for a little while. Seven gets taken and gets removed off the queue. One shuffles up and there's space now for more work, if there is any. If the manager's a bit slow at this point, I don't know, perhaps it's gone away to read a sense of value or water level in a tank or bees in the beehive, why not? It could take a little while before it does that. And indeed, some tasks might be very slow running. It might only put a value there, you know, once a minute or something. So anyway, if this worker task here has now flashed the LED seven times, it goes, give me more work, and the one is taken and disappears from the queue again. Now, flashing one 
LED once is, is pretty quick, so it does it. It says, give me more work. Oh, there isn't any. OK, well, I'll just sit here and wait. And while it's waiting, it does not consume any CPU cycles. So it is quite efficient to do it that way, have tasks sitting around. Now, we've said for both these tasks in this little demo, I'm prepared to wait forever. The task one worker task is prepared to wait forever until something arrives. And task zero, the manager, is prepared to wait forever until a position becomes available in this queue because we've told it that we've said in our demo sketch wait forever but we could have said wait far far less time than that we could say wait 10 milliseconds wait 10 seconds wait 10 minutes but whatever when that time expires the attempt to place a value on the queue here or to read off a value will finish and the value returned from that attempt will contain a value that your code can interrogate and say oh i didn't manage to get a value on this queue in time and i need to take some action and similarly, the worker task can say, I waited for the time you told me to get a value and there wasn't one. So now you need to take the correct action in your code to deal with that logic. Now, we'll discuss this more in the main video. But remember, this task zero and task one can all be running on the same core. And in fact, that's the recommended way to do it. Remember that your, your ESP32 has two cores. So you've got core zero and core one, not to be confused with task numbering. Zero tends to be used by Artos for running things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and stuff like that. Now, whilst you can put extra tasks in here, if you start starving the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth tasks from CPU cycles, your ESP32 will panic and crash. So the general advice from Espressive is use Core 1 for your tasks and very carefully think about whether you need to use Core 0 or not. So these can be on the same core, they can both run on core 1 simultaneously, as we'll show in the demo. So is there an easier way of allowing these two tasks to communicate without the use of a queue? There is, but you still have to be careful. At the end of the day, it might be more work than actually creating a queue. The first thing you can use, of course, is something called a global variable. We've all used them. And, uh, well, they're no different in this context than in any other context in, with your Arduino. Let's assume we've got an integer. Um, integer, what we're going to call it, temperature, and uh, equals what? We don't know because the manager hasn't yet put something in there. But it's a global variable declared at the top of your sketch before the setup and all that. Well, the manager can write to that value, and the t work task here can read that value. And more than likely, nothing will go wrong with that. So they can do this without any other involvement, except the expressive say, hmm. We don't guarantee that. It will probably work, but it's not the way to do things. If you're going to do this global variable sharing, then you really need to also introduce, once again, semaphores. And this time, we need something called a mutex semaphore, mutually exclusive semaphore. It's quite simple, but both tasks are going to have to do it. So that when task one worker is reading from that variable, it sets a semaphore to says I'm taking the semaphore and you cannot update it task zero once it's read it it will remove that and say okay you can update it when you want because I'm not in the process of actually reading it this microsecond but when the task task zero here wants to update it it says well I'm about to update this you work a task cannot read it because you might be reading it in the middle of me updating it and goodness knows what's going to happen then so we need to set up a semaphore at both ends to protect this value via this mutex. Simple to do, but whether it's any simpler than creating a queue, well, that's for you to decide. Right, now you've got an idea of what queues are happening, you'll understand exactly what's going on with these little flashy LEDs. So the manager, the, uh, the instigator of the work, is the blue LED, and the red one is the one that's flashing the LED n number of times. So... I'll put the um, debug window on this as well so we can follow it through the, what's happening. But if you even now you can see that the blue LED is not flashing that often because the red one isn't getting through the work enough. Occasionally you might see a double flash. Now that was quite a quick flash. Um, even a triple sometimes. But obviously the manager here is having difficulty putting stuff on that queue because red isn't clearing it quickly enough. Let's put the um, serial monitor on, as I just said, and see what's really going on. Right, so the worker, the red one, is the one on the left here, saying I'm reading whatever value you've put in the queue, and the manager is saying I'm adding these numbers to the queue. 
Now remember in that diagram that I showed you, the manager is trying to put them on as quickly as it can, but we've added an artificial delay in there to make sure it's not you know, stupidly quick. And generally, look, it's one for one, but occasionally, as in here, let me just stop it right there, occasionally you see that a worker manages to get through a little bit more work because the work it's trying to do, look, flashing an LED once, is quick, so it quickly snatched another one off the queue, which is a four. Now that one and four came from probably up here, so one and four because the queue I've got is a five position queue. We can put five integers on there. So it snatched off one and four, but then because it took two off, the manager said, ah, I've got two positions to fill now, and I'll quickly add them as well. So that's what's happening. And if you look at the flashes down here in the actual diagram here, you can see that the manager is quite slow in putting work on the queue, and the red one's just going on and on and on and on, okay? Occasionally, as I say, you might find two, sometimes, sometimes even three flashes from the manager putting some work on that queue. But what we can do is emulate what happens if the, if the manager wants to have a, a tea break, for example. He goes, ah, I've had enough, I don't want to do any more work. So if I press this switch, it basically tells the manager to go and have a tea break and not put work on the queue anymore. When that happens, you'll see that the red one runs out of work pretty quick. Now look, you can see behind my head, the manager's having a tea break. The worker's reading the queue, there's only five elements, and, well, it's stopped now. See? So it's done all those. If you look on the right-hand side, working up, it says, going backwards, it says adding eight to the queue, adding one, adding three, adding six, and that's exactly what on the left-hand side down the bottom, it's, it's done. So the queue, at the moment, is empty. So when I let go of this little switch, the manager will find that there's plenty of space in there, and it will fill it as quickly as the code allows it to fill it and the worker will quickly snatch work off that queue. So I'm going to let my finger off. Oh, I'm in the way again. Now you see there, look, the manager's managed to add a three. Oh, and again three. So it's added three up here to the queue in one go, and here, and another two, because the queue was being read reasonably quickly, but more to the point, it was empty to begin with. So it's, it's added one, added one. Oh, now there's, I can add three in one go. So that's exactly how it would work. Now, can you guess, well not guess, but work out, if the manager is trying to put work on that queue, but the queue's full because the worker is not getting through the work enough, what could you do to alleviate that? Exactly. Add another worker task. So where we have at the moment one little busy bee trying to flash that LED, what happens if we had two? Well, obviously it gets through twice as much work, wouldn't it? So you can add extra tasks, but with that comes a certain level of complexity. If you're trying to write, for example, to the LED to make it flash, but the other task is also writing to it or turning it off, there's a bit of a struggle there, isn't there? And once again, you should really not share resources like that unless you're going to put a semaphore, a mutex semaphore, in the way. So it starts getting a little bit trickier. But then again, we are, you know, we're using a more complicated chip, aren't we? This is not an Arduino. This is a dual core multitasking system with a real time operating system managing it all. So, yes, it is a little bit more complex. Let's have a look at the code, what I've done here then. Right, so the code then, uh, pretty much like you saw in the previous video, we're going to use uh, a couple of tasks at the top. So I've called them still task zero and task one. I suspect if I were writing this for a real project, I'd name them a lot more descriptively than that. So I might, na uh, I might name one task get water level and another one task display water level, for example because task zero, task one means nothing apart from the fact last demo we were running them on core zero, core one. But we'll leave them as is for now, I think it's okay. Now what we're introducing here though is a queue. So there's a queue handle type, and we're calling it rather, rather unimaginatively queue. Once again, I'd probably call that something a bit more meaningful as well. We've still got our two LEDs on 27 and 25. My switch there on pin two simply allows me to tell one of those tasks, stop, stop work, have a tea break. That's all, okay, it's just for demo purposes. Right, so loop one, uh, loop zero though, much the same as what we had previously. Um, it's a do forever loop. Um, we're generating a random number now to go onto that worker queue list, that's all, but that's not important. What is more important is that we're sending stuff out on a queue like this. Let's just whiz through those parameters very easily. 
So the queue we've defined at the top, right? So we're saying queue, send this to the queue and using this particular function, it'll always fill it from the back. So the first one in is the first one out. But uh, when you send it, it'll always go in behind any others. The random number, that's remember, it's a pointer to the random number. So you need the ampersand. And we're saying here, wait forever if that queue is not well, available, I suppose. Available is probably the wrong word. If there's no space on that queue, wait until there is forever. Uh, then it flashes the blue LED just once, just to show that it's done some work. Um, checks to see whether it should be taking a tea break or not by me pressing that button. And that's it. I mean, there's no more to it. So it's doing all that work, you know, pushing it onto the queue and forgetting about it. There's no, there's no tie up between what the task is doing, the queue, and what happens to that queue. It's, it says, look, all you've told me to do is put stuff on a queue. I don't know what's happening to it after that. I don't know if it's being read, not being read being corrupted don't know don't care it's single responsibility time here keep your tasks nice and small and doing one thing much much easier to debug as well especially in the multitasking system now okay this is the manager then that was the manager code let's have a look at what the actual worker is doing so the worker is saying right i'm receiving from the queue remember first in first out queue name as as previously there's my variable that i declared here so that's a a reference to that variable and once again I'm saying wait forever if there's no work on that queue if you can't read something from that queue just wait until there is something and at that point remember no CPU cycles are being uh, consumed okay now assuming it does manage to read something it says it prints out here what it's actually reading so this this bit here for example is where this bit comes out and just as a quick aside if you're using string with a capital S like that in Arduino world or ESP8266, don't blame me if your program eventually crashes because it does fragment the heap memory. And it, it, it string just wasn't, uh, well, wasn't written particularly well, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but here, I think the string has, is a different implementation altogether. So anyway, I'm using it as part of the serial print, uh, converting that integer to a string so we can put it all out on one line and then I'm saying now flash that LED um, however many times you need to flash it according to the number on the queue. Uh, I did originally put a slow motion delay in here but basically it made it so slow that even I got bored okay right so that's that's the two worker tasks then well, manager task and worker task setup, I think, is probably pretty much. And this is where we create the queue. It's five slots and the size of an integer, which is two bytes, please. So that's 10 bytes. That's it. Two tasks, though, and they're both pinned here. Look, to task to core one yeah, on both of them. So we're not using core zero and upsetting Wi-Fi and all the rest of it. And eventually we come to the original loop. So when you start a new sketch, you get your setup and your loop. What what exactly are we going to be using this loop for? Um, hmm. In this particular demo, we haven't really got a use for it. But as we saw last time, if you don't put something in there, like a delay, delay one, yield will not work because yield translates to uh, something else and it, it's not enough. You need to actually put a delay in there. Delay, of course, is an Arduino expression, isn't it? It's not C++. Delay is Arduino friendly speak. What delay translates to in this implementation is a V task delay and the number of milliseconds in, in brackets. So if, if you typed in V task delay 100, it would delay for 100 milliseconds. If you type in delay 100, the compiler just changes your delay to a V task delay and compiles it exactly the same. So if you want to stay with Arduino friendly language you can there's no there's no downside on the other hand though if you thought hmm, i want to move away from that arduino land speak a little bit and more into artos world you know esp32 c++ speak then by all means use the vtas delay and there's lots of things like that but back to our loop what are we what are we actually going to do with this loop it seems seems a shame doesn't it in some ways that we have to put a delay in there so that the 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 program that surrounds all this that says run setup, run loop forever in that same for construct that you saw. Um, and all the loop does is say, put me on the queue to delay me, please, for one millisecond. 
one millisecond later it comes off the queue gets ready to consume cycles doesn't need any ends the task comes back in put me on the queue please for, for suspension for one it's it's madness to do it that way so what can we do in that loop well what i've done it seems to work quite well is to say look delete me the first time you come in here delete this task that's running that was scheduled by someone else not me though and remove me entirely so i don't i don't get called again and that works wonderfully well now whilst that is an option i've also used the loop more as a a coordinator of tasks if you're writing lots of tasks you know whether it's loop one loop zero named properly of course then i've found that uh, in some of my demo sketches that i've just written for me now um, i've used loop to do things with these other tasks so for example i can say do you know what suspend loop zero please because i'm not ready for that one and let loop one run for a bit and then when certain conditions are met i'll say ah unsuspend loop zero now and see what it says and it goes and runs so you can do all six all sorts of things like that you don't have to delete the task however if you wanted to run a task say like loop zero but you only wanted this run for a little while until certain conditions are met and then that's it you've done your business i don't want to hear from you ever again all you need to do in this loop is have an if statement and say if certain conditions are met delete me please so v task delete with a null as a parameter instead of a task handle deletes the current running task so the alternative then to queues okay yes global variables as you saw in the uh, the drawing global variables yeah they sort of work well they not sort of work they do work but there's always that contention issue and you need to add in semaphores so what we've got here is a semaphore two leds um what else yeah so what we've got here then is an unsigned long where we're going to add something to account so there's two tasks zero and one both writing to the same variable to say update 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 and the count just goes up and we display that value okay so the tasks themselves so this is task uh, well loop zero i've called it but it's task zero um, basically it grabs the semaphore updates the count in in that print and then releases it uh, oh yeah the plus plus in front of the variable rather than behind it means update this variable first then carry on if you put it behind the count so count zero plus plus it means do whatever you're doing and then add one okay so yeah i suppose i should have made a note about that anyway so all that's doing then is updating this count with a semaphore in front of it and behind it and it course it all runs in you know microseconds flashes the led and here we've got a delay oh you can see now this is where i've described the delay um, for 300 milliseconds it's the same as v task you can choose whichever one you want and note it is the task that is blocked not the entire thread well the task isn't exactly blocked it's it's put onto the suspend queue i guess you call it it's described in more technical terms in the expressive documentation okay so when you say delay me it takes it out of the ready queue puts it into a, a suspend queue and then back again when it's ready ready means I'm ready to receive some CPU cycles to actually do some work. Remember, the code's sitting there in memory, but nothing's happening. It's not being executed because the scheduler is keeping control and time slicing as required all the different tasks on a particular uh, core. And it does that for both cores independently. So being ready to run doesn't mean you will run. And especially if there's a higher priority task waiting to run, that will get serviced first. But when we set up our tasks, I think you remember we set them all up as either priority zero or one. Don't want to go there yet. That's for another time. So loop zero does that. And guess what loop one does? Yep, exactly the same. No difference at all. OK, so in the setup, we set up both tasks. Right. Here's my semaphore that we've created it as a mutually exclusive semaphore. Um, creating into two tasks exactly as we did before nothing different about it really both running on uh, core one and core one and that's it and then on the loop what do we do on the loop now that was me experimenting with suspending tasks but basically in this implementation we're doing a delete okay let's um, see if this works then let me upload and we'll come right back okay so here we are that's all uploaded and i've moved me out of the way of it so you can see behind my hand and see all this running so the leds down here are flashing away just to say say yeah I've, I've done what you asked me to do so the red one's flashing quite quickly really compared to the blue one 
which is why in loop one you're seeing lots of additions to that counter it's adding up one to the counter a lot quicker than the loop zero is which you can't even see properly but there it is let me just stop that there we are so it's running quite happily and as you can see they're not being corrupted the 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 integer that it's adding, this counter, in fact it was a long, wasn't it, um, is protected by that mutex, that mutually exclusive semaphore. So only one task can update it at a time. Now you might think, do you know what, I can't be bothered with all that, I'm just going to write it to the to the global variable in the, in the first place and, and hope for the best. Well, hope for the best, but eventually it will go wrong. Now, going wrong might not mean bad things yeah i mean if you're counting bees in the beehive and you miss a count or add two to a count does it really matter no but it's not good programming practice and you're making shortcuts and it's it's not a good way to do things so adding in a semaphore like this is a good way to do it but is it any better than queue well you tell me writing to a queue and reading off a queue without any semaphores or having a global variable with a semaphore either side to say yes you can write yes you can read and so on is that any better? Pays your money, takes your choice. Right, one final thing then before we close down this sketch. This some um, unsigned long here that we're writing to by both sketches. You notice that I put a volatile on it and a static. Now I'm not convinced, I read about this, I'm not convinced the static is necessary but the volatile could well be, in fact is. Expressive say it is. Because think about what's happening. The compiler has compiled all the code and it knows which variable it's writing to from task one and it knows about task zero but it doesn't know the two are writing to the same it's you know, the compiler is not that clever so if it writes one to a variable and it has that variable value in a register rather than the memory location because it's already read it once it's keeping it in a register the compiler optimizes that and goes, well, I don't need to read it from the memory anymore because I've got it in the register now and nothing else is in that register. I'll use the register value instead. So if you're reading that value from the register in the same task, that's absolutely fine. But what if another task has come along and it's updated the memory value as we are doing here? Most certainly we're updating the memory. Well, the compiler is still reading it out of the register. It's not reading the real value up here you're going to get corruption, which is why you need volatile. What volatile tells the compiler is, do not read the value in a register, even if you think you've got it in there, ignore that, go back and read it from the memory. Simple as that, that's what volatile does. Okay, that's it. Right, I think, um, yeah, we were talking about speed, weren't we, and that big slowdown for the prime numbers? Well, that's all. It brings an end, really, to that bit of the video. If you're not worried about um, the next bit coming up, about the speed difference and all that, you can bail now, but please do leave some comments down below. And uh, if you think it's worth it, stick a like on it. Tell your friends, family, neighbours, everything about the channel. You know what I mean. OK, really nice to have you with us. See you next week. OK, we've come to that bit where we're going to find out why this is now running so slow. It was 68 milliseconds uh, last time, running all those prime numbers. Anyway, the point is it's now running at 1.7-ish uh, seconds. Let's, let's have a look at the code, shall we, and see what it's doing. Right, so the code is, as you can see, as, as we saw last time. So let's um, connect up a serial monitor view. Uh, that one there. And it says, running loop. Here we go. 1751 milliseconds that's 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 it was running in 68 milliseconds right now it's running in 1751 that is that is a huge slowdown so what's happened yeah i know you think i'm going to be you know it's not clickbait believe me it's not clickbait this is a, a serious thing that you probably want to do at some point if we look in the code scroll down a bit yeah that's all the gubbins bloody bloody blah um, oh, well, there is a bit that should have changed. Where's it gone? Oh, I know, in setup. And just before I click open the setup here, I've had to record this in arrears. How fast, by default, is the ESP32 running? To give you an idea, the Arduino Uno runs at 16 megahertz. All right, the chip itself could run at 20, but because of the crystal and the divide and all that, they've chosen 16. So that's what all Arduino Unos and Nanos run at, 16 megahertz. I think the Mega might also run at that, I'm not sure. Anyway, 
Um, so how fast is this running at? 240 megahertz exactly i mean that is pretty fast isn't it 240 dual core i mean this is getting into you know the computers of yesteryear isn't it okay carry on right so what have we done in setup that's so different right look at this so set cpu frequency yeah and i'm running whoa 10 megahertz 10 Okay, so 240 megahertz is the default, which is so much faster, isn't it, than the Arduino. But now we're actually running slower than the Arduino. 10 megahertz versus the Arduino's 16. So how come it's still running faster than the Arduino? Well, I guess that's the architecture, isn't it? It's got two cores, I suppose. It's using both cores, or the task scheduler is, maybe, possibly. Who knows what it's doing behind the scenes. That's RTOS, isn't it, or RTOS. So we can set any speed we like here, two, well not any speed we like, it's got to be one of these, 240, 160, so it's a multiple of, you know, whatever this is a multiple of. There's only some, some you can do. If you try putting something else in there, I did try to get it down to 1 megahertz, and immediately an error came up at runtime saying, well you can't do that, I'm just leaving it alone. So just to prove then that it was this speed thing, let's change that back to um, the full 240. Right, and compile that and upload it and all the rest of the gubbins. I'll speed this bit up, don't worry. Right, off it's going to build. It does take quite some time to build sometimes, depending on what you've done before. Right, time to speed up the video. Okay, it's actually uploading it now. Keep your, your eyes on this bit behind my head. There we are, look, back to 61 milliseconds. Was it 61? I thought it was 68. Oh, well. Oh, well, 61, 62, whatever. It's, it's a huge difference, isn't it? Just by changing that speed. Now, you might say, all right, it, well, why wasn't this clickbait then? You said it was running slow and now it's running full speed again. Well, the point is, of course, the faster it runs, the more power it's going to consume. And if you're just waking this up every now and again to do something, um, do you really want it running at 240 megahertz? I can remember when Pentiums ran at 200 megahertz, and that was like, wow, really big thing, you know? So we're running a microcontroller here, a dual core microcontroller, not just one of those single ones at 240 megahertz. Do you really need it to go that fast if you're just reading a rain sensor or something? Some, some, something that you're possibly running on battery power. That's the whole point, isn't it? You could wake this up and uh, run it at 10 megahertz and it would use far, far less power. Um, and I'm not going to measure it, but it does use less power. That's what Expressive say. And it could still do the work maybe a little bit slower as we've seen but well you have to make your own minds up i'm just giving you the option here to uh, change the speed to whatever you want okay so that's why it was running slower 1.75 seconds compared to 68 uh, 62 milliseconds what a difference that speed makes use it as you will you can't as far as i know change each individual core it's just the, the whole thing right the cpu as a whole so that's the way it is. All right, that's it. Just thought it might be useful for you to know that. And that just about brings an end to the, the entire video now. Thanks very much for keeping up to the very end. Um, I do love your comments. Don't forget to put them down below. Um, if you think it's worth it, stick a thumbs up on it. And uh, keep watching. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.